lovely to be here. Kia ora koutou, uh, namihi nui. So uh, I'm here basically, as I understand it, to talk about the research I did for uh, this book, My Mother and Other Secrets. So I'm actually going to be talking about the other secrets. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you how that came about and then how I did the research and what I discovered. So um my mother is has dementia so she and my father moved up to live with us um towards the end of that drama when things were getting a little bit unusual as they do in dementia land uh so the the idea for the book was oh i have to write about dementia and looking after someone with dementia because we were really at the cold face and i was aware that not many people it was a new you know it's becoming an epidemic but it's something that every family is starting to have to deal with as our parents age uh, and don't die young anymore. Uh, my Both my parents' parents were dead and gone by 70s, 60s, 70s. So this is a new generation that we are, where our, our families, our parents are living longer, which is great. We love having them around longer, but it also means the care falls to us. And in some cases, uh, dementia is a really challenging time. And I'm sure anyone out there listening who's been involved with this will understand what I'm saying. So I started taking notes about that and then my mother died uh, in 2019 and I suddenly thought, right, it's time to write her book. My mother had a lot of secrets, uh, a very interesting past life. She would talk to me about it quite a bit, but leave out a lot of it. Uh, and she would say, when I'm dead, you can write about me because she had quite a high opinion of herself as well. I think she thought she was... <laughs> Pretty interesting. Uh, so I took her at her word and I thought, right, here we go. Uh, so how I started with trying to unravel her life, I need to just explain her background. She was adopted uh, as a child of a unmarried mother. Uh, she was born in 33 and adopted, you know, really quickly after that. Uh, she never met her uh, birth father or his family, never said she never knew who he was. I suspect she did. But anyway, that was her story. Don't don't know who he is. You know, find out after I'm dead, blah, blah, blah. Uh, did know her birth mother, who also had a very interesting story, it turns out. Uh, so that was the, the background. And I would get little stories about how awful mum's childhood was. She uh, really had a hard time, um, as a lot of children did in Depression and Second World War. It was tough times for everyone. Uh, so I decided, right, I'm going to find out everything that went on in my mother's life. I'm going to find my grandfather, my birth grandfather. Uh, and here we go. Fortunately, it was COVID. So I was in lockdown, lost all my work. So I wasn't writing for magazines anymore. I wasn't doing any broadcasting. I wasn't writing any books. Uh, so it was a perfect time, actually. And a lot of people say this about the lockdowns. So they got a lot of stuff done that they never would have got done. Fortunately, before my mother died, in fact, about six years before, I had taken her DNA and put it into Ancestry.com. I did that because I was editing a magazine at the time, I think it was Australian Women's Weekly, and we were approached by the Ancestry people and, you know, we'll give you a free blah, blah, and, you know, just do this. Never really thought twice about it. I just took the sample of mine and hers. I don't know why I did mine as well, but anyway, mine and hers. Uh, and sent it off. Of course, since then, there's all these um, concerns about DNA, and I, I can't tell you what they are because I don't want to read about them. <laughs> you know, ooh, I might get cloned or, or something like that. So I fortunately had not thought any further than let's just get this DNA done and see what happens. Well, we did send it away, came back, turns out I'm 100% Scandinavian. So that meant that mum's side... Um, not 100%, like 95%, a bit of Irish and English and French. Uh, but that means it was strongly that mum's father must have been Scandinavian because my, my father is Scandinavian and I didn't know my mother was Scandinavian. So that was one tip. Then um, my mother was in dementia then. So she was like, oh, I don't want to know. You know she just wasn't really there. So I thought, well, I turned ancestry off for good. I just thought, well, she's, uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, got busy, of course, working and caring for her. So after she died, fast forward, I logged into Ancestry.com and suddenly all these messages, I don't know if this has ever happened to anyone out there, but all these messages started flooding in from my cousins on my mum's father's side. So they had found us 
but we hadn't replied. Uh, and so within, I think it was about 48, 24, to, no, about 48 hours, I had found out not only who my grandfather was, but I had 20 new cousins. Uh, I found out that she had one living sibling, half sibling alive, and she was in Australia. So that was pretty amazing and quite, sort of sat me down for a little bit. And I just thought, okay, well, here we go. And so what I found out about her father, well, the first thing that one of my cousins said, who is a bit of a genealogy uh, person, so he had done a lot of work already. Uh, he said, when we went to my grandfather's funeral, we were waiting to see how many other children <laughs> turned up. So, sorry, that's my rooster. Shut the door. Um, so, uh, yeah, he had a bit of a reputation as being a bit of a um, serial, uh, what's the word they had in those days? Can't remember the exact word, but yeah, he got around. Uh, and so we were the first fa first family to turn up. Um, and then the story started coming back that my mother had told me. So she told me that when my grandmother got pregnant, her mother, Eileen, was working for this guy on the farm as a farm girl. Like you, you, they used to send them out at 14 to, you know, help, help the mum, the farm and, you know, do all that work. So she was sent to this farm in Pehu. Uh, which is just out from New Plymouth. I've been, since been to visit. It's, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Vigil. It's deep, deep and dark and hilly and misty and absolutely captured my imagination. It was not pretty at all. Uh, very hard land to farm, uh, very hard to access. Anyway, so she was sent to work there, got pregnant, was raped by the father, my mother would tell me. Um, but then her family, Eileen's family, decided to sue the farmer's family, the farmer. Um, and I'll tell you his name. His name is Rupert. His name was Rupert Larson. So apparently they sued him for um, paternity. And that was very common. I since found when I started researching that it was very common in that era in the 30s. Uh, there's a lot of announcements in the papers uh, classified, you know, such and such is ordered to pay this much paternity every week, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and apparently they won and apparently they got lots of money and apparently it was in the papers. It was, mum, mum was convinced about this. It was in the papers. So I uh, decided I needed to find that court report. That would be interesting uh, and find out some details. And the long story short is papers passed, which I highly recommend if you're researching any relative or any family member or anyone. Papers passed is such a gift. Of course, I'm going to say that because I'm a newspaper journalist uh, trained. It, that's the first job I ever had was in a newspaper. So there's about, a, I think it goes back to, some of it goes back to 1879. Some of it goes up to 1920, 1979. So we're talking, 1839, sorry. So if you're lucky, some papers have been micro put on microfiche, put in the system, digitalized, and you can literally search any, any reports about anyone that you know. Uh, and my advice for you in that is go broad as possible. It might mean that you have to read through a lot of Larsons that aren't your Larsons. Um, but in that case, you also find other Larsons that are quite interesting <laughs> and might be your Larsons. And of course, they had big families in those days. So there's often brothers and sisters. Uh, so I searched Rupert Larson and, um, and Eileen Gallagher, who's my, my grandmother's name nothing came up in any of the court reports, in any of the papers I searched. And I think the problem was that the Daily News, which in New Plymouth in those days reported all the court reports, uh, hasn't been digitized or it's been lost or something that they haven't got it. Um, so that was a bit frustrating because I really wanted proof of that. Uh, but I kind of got it from my new cousin. So um, Rupert's children, uh, and, and his nieces and nephews told me that they had heard about this as, as, as well. So their mother had told them about this disgusting thing that happened. They went to court. Her brother was a lawyer and refused to defend them. So she didn't talk to him for the rest of his life. So you can start to see how just one little search starts to bring up all these amazing stories. So I talked to my cousins and I said, well, I heard that story and you heard that story. So let's say that happened. 
to this day, we don't know for sure. All we heard was what our family told us. So I could never find the court report. So that is a shame because it's never actually draw, drawn a line under that. But what we do know is that Eileen got pregnant possibly on her 16th birthday because mum was born nine months later. Uh, she had, uh, she went to Wellington and was put into the uh, equivalent of a Bethany home. She gave birth to my mother. Um, and that's when the next part of the story started because she came back to New Plymouth to her parents. When she got there, nothing had been prepared for the baby. No cot, no nothing. She had the nappies that she had been embroidering while she was pregnant. She called mum Beverly originally. Uh, so she'd embroidered all these nappies, little singlets. You know, she had all that stuff, but no equipment. Nevertheless, she moved in, sat down with her baby, loved her baby, genuinely loved her baby. Uh, and then one day her mother said, uh, you need to go to the hairdresser to get your hair done. You look, you look a wreck. So she went into town on her bike to get her hair done. She came back, no Beverly. I knew the story from my mother. Uh, so then being a little bit forthright, uh, something I have inherited from her, uh, she would get on her bike every day and go looking for Beverly, the new plumber. She just about strangled her sister to tell her where Beverly had gone. So Beverly, be, mum had been advertised in the paper, very common, uh, again, that I found from papers past. Uh, lots and lots of children um, advertised for adoption. No, no, no government involvement, no agency involvement. It's just like, please come and have my naughty 12 year old that I can't be bothered looking after basically. Um, or please come and pick up my baby. I'll give her to you. Um, and they often had to say from a good family. Uh, so mum was advertised. Her sister knew surname of where she had been taken. So my grandmother, Eileen, did some research, the Peterson family, looked them up in the phone book. No, phone book, electoral records, I'm not sure which one she used. Anyway, found an address in Fitzroy, New Plymouth. Every day she would get on her bike and she would ride round Fitzroy, waiting to see someone walking a baby in a pram. And then she was going to rush up and have a look at the baby <laughs> and see if she recognised it. Um, what happened wasn't too dissimilar. She was riding past a house and... This is the thing I struggle with. My mother would never hang washing out the front of your house because it was rude. You didn't want neighbours seeing your underwear. So it was back of the house is where you hung your washing. But apparently out the front of this house, and I'm thinking maybe it was, you know, with those old villas, you had, um, you know, bits of wood that you strung clothes off or a line. Anyway, she's riding along. She sees these nappies, the baby, stops her bike, goes down the garden path, looks closely, sure enough, there's the embroidery that she did in the unmarried mother's home. So rather than go home and think about it, again, forthright, she, and I imagined this bit in my book because I can see her doing it, hands on hips, uh, she knocked on the door and she basically said, you have my baby. Fortunately, the woman who opened the door was my uh, my step-grandmother, the woman who adopted my mother, her real mother, as far as my mother is concerned, Olive. And Olive had had an interesting backstory, which if I've got time, I'll tell you about that as well, because I also researched her. Uh, took her in, they had a cup of tea, and came to an arrangement that 16-year-old, now I think she was nearly 17, uh, Eileen could come and visit her baby, Beverly, who was now called Elsie, and take her for walks and just play with her. So that was all tied into a nice little bundle. Olive, by the way, just quickly, Olive, her, her mother who adopted her, had two sons by the age of 21 and married a horse trainer, father. He was 45 when she was 20, giving birth to the first one. He ended up losing all his money. She ended up they, he ended up living in a hotel in um, Hau, not Haura, one of those places down there. Uh, and anyway, he lost all his money, killed himself in the river. <laughs> so, so she suddenly got no husband and two boys under two. So I feel that some of that was in her heart when she talked to Eileen. She knew what it was like to be abandoned and to be helpless and to just want to look after your babies. So 
that's the start of my mother's story. Now, I'm supposed to be talking about research, so let's go back to the research. So Ancestry.com gave me the names of uh, not only my father's, my grandfather's family, but all his family going back. So I saw very quickly Norwegian, very Norwegian, very similar to my father's family, which were Danish. They all sort of came out in that flush of people coming to New Zealand to timber mill, basically men chopping down timber. Um, so that also gave me um, an interest. So I had the core of my mother and I thought, what about my dad? So this is the generation again that keeps secrets. So dad's father left home at eight to go to a mental hospital uh, when my dad was eight. He had returned from World War I. He was a very good soldier in World War I, got injured a bit, but got promoted really high up in the ranks. Um, when dad was about eight, his father was taken away or left to go to a mental hospital. He never saw him again. So the what he was told was that he was gassed in the war and this was like effects of the gas. What I found out is that he had contracted syphilis as did about, I think, I've got it in my book, about 70,000 New Zealand salt, anyway, a lot. Uh, he was 19 when he went to war. Um, so syphilis, you have an initial, in this case, you have initial flush of, you know, symptoms, then it just can, it just disappears for years. So in his case, it was all gone. Uh, he had no idea he had it. And at the age of 40, for him, it came back and it affected his brain. He was grandiose. He was violent. He went from being a really beautiful, according to my, my nana, you know, beautiful, good father to just out of his mind. Uh, so I, this is another research tool that you can do if you're lucky enough. So you can get hospital records. A lot of our families were put into mental hospitals in the old days for very uh, strange reasons. A lot of women in particular, they were acting out. Uh, my husband has some old aunts that he swears were put into hospital because they were lesbians. He can't actually find out. But what I managed to do, and this was a lucky, lucky, lucky strike, I found out that he was in a hospital, Tokoroa uh, Mental Hospital, which looking at the pictures of it, it was like something out of, you know, an Agatha Christie TV series and someone's in the mental home and it's all beautiful gardens and they're just sort of strolling around. It's a lovely old house, very like that. Uh, in those days, they, the patients kept a garden and my father, my grandfather was involved in that work. He loved it. Um, they, you know, they were sort of allowed outside and they were allowed to be creative and they were allowed to, you know, they weren't just locked in, which happened in, later in the 80s when it all got closed down. And now it's just this rubble. I applied for his health records, medical records from the hospital. They are, they were saved. Uh, I don't know why, but they were. To get them, I had to go through the Waikato Health Board. Fortunately, they have a, a whole a woman whose job it is to take these queries, who was really lovely to me. The only uh, stumbling block is that if you want their records, their next of kin has to sign off. So if my dad wasn't alive, I would have had to go all through all my cousins on my father's side and get them all to sign a document saying, yes, Wendell can have these. I wasn't confident that some of them would let me do that. Um, which again, brings up privacy issues. Fortunately, my dad was alive. So it just needed, he was the last living uh, next of to, to my grandfather. He signed it off. Um, and I've got it here to show you because it's pretty astounding. Pages, like this arrived on my computer pages oh sorry not doing a very good job pages and pages of letters records those handwritten ones are all the letters my grandmother wrote trying to find out when her husband would be coming home and the reason she was writing all those letters is they never told her that he had syphilis well no, they did tell her right at the end when he died uh, so one of the heart, when the, the woman who was helping me was sending them to me, she said, I just have to warn you, these are really, really sad. This is really just that your, your grandmother loved your grandfather so much. Reading her letters will be very emotional. I was prepared. 
And sure enough, there's letter after letter after letter. Can you tell me what's wrong with my husband? Why can't he come home? Um, what do I need to do? Uh, and he's, all she got in reply with is really nasty, I thought, um, letters saying, you know, basically treating her like an imbecile because she was a woman, just saying, uh, you don't need to know. We are looking after him uh, and uh, he needs to stay here. So he did. Eight years he stayed there from 40 to 48. Initially, he was great, uh, you know, a little bit grandiose. We'd get into fights with fellow patients about uh, he thought that he was a, um, I shouldn't laugh, but he thought he was a spy. And he thought that he was about to go on a mission to Europe. Uh, he thought he was a millionaire. It's so very common with grandiose um, people from syphilis. Uh, and of course, eventually he got worse and then it became harrowing reading how he was just basically strapped to a bed uh, to stop him scratching himself because he had lesions. Uh, the drugs that they gave him, very, very strong drugs to calm him down uh, and what looks like a really horrific death, like really horrible. So you see every note that has been made about your relative by nurses, by doctors, uh, and it's stunning. And what a magnificent piece of research to be given. And I feel so grateful to the Waikato Health Board that they bothered to actually set up a system for people who are searching. Uh, so suddenly I had my mother's father, uh, birth father, all his family I'm in touch with them. I've met some of my cousins. I'm going to a reunion in January. I'm going to meet them all. It's all going to be great. Um, by the way, it don't look like any of them. That's the other thing that sort of you expect. You expect when you find someone that you're going to, oh, same hair, same eyes, same something. The only physical thing I could see was between my mother and her half-sister, who now sadly has died. I never got to see her because I was going to fly over, but then COVID came. So yeah, don't look at all like the Larsons. Can't see any similarities, which is disappointing. <laughs> I was kind of hoping to see, oh, picture just like me. Um, and then now I had my grandfather's history of syphilis. And uh, the other sad thing was there was a letter from my auntie in the 80s uh, to them saying, oh, um, after my grandmother had died, so the secret had gone with her, saying, I, I need to know why my father was in this hospital. Could you tell me? And the guy who was in charge of the hospital at the time was really lovely and wrote her a letter, but asked the local social worker in her area to deliver it to her and sit with her. See, amazing how much it changed um, healthcare over the years. So then I had his story. Um, how can I help you with the research for that? So for research, I used Ancestry, obviously. So Ancestry, I found quite frustrating because I was trying to find my uh, father's mother's family in England, because she did the classic, left England to marry my grandfather in New Zealand. They met in the war. I also found the dance card that they danced at when they met, just in some like rubbish that dad was <laughs> put away in a box. So I wanted to know all about her family, which has proved quite difficult. But um, so Ancestry.com can give you births, deaths and marriages. It can give you, so it's really useful as a source to get information. You can find photos that have been lodged. It also depends on who else is searching in your family. So uh, no one's done much searching, searching in England for the more due family, which is my Nana's family. So when I was looking, so I will try again and just try and see, um, you know, what happened to that family and who I'm related to over there. So we've got Nana Nissen, dad, you know, grandfather Nissen. We've got mum's uh, birth mother to do. Found her birth father, birth mother. She knew her birth mother. So I told you the story about Eileen going around and taking her for walks. And she got a job in the local jewel shop in town in New Plymouth and she got a new boyfriend. So on the weekends she would go out, she'd put mum in a pram and the two of them would walk her around. And I think she was probably trying to pretend like she was, you know, a normal mother and could walk her child around. And then she'd go home, have a cup of tea and put the tea on, you know, put the dinner on. Um, so one day she's out walking with the, with the boyfriend and her boss from the jeweler shop sees her. She goes to work on the Monday. He said, I didn't know you were married and I didn't know you had a child. And she said, well, I'm not married, but I do have a child. Lost her job that afternoon. 
So she, Eileen's story is not great. She had a really tough time. She then rushed off and married some guy, uh, a British guy. He went to war, uh, World War II. So she thought, well, I'll, I'll get the widow, I'll get the soldiers. You know, you've got a pension as the wife. Found out he's already married in England. Uh, I so I found all that out. I, I we none of us knew that. So I found out. So she divorced him. Then she, uh, she had a child with him, and then she married a Dalmatian, as it was in those days, uh, immigrant who was targeted during World War Two, and you know, people didn't like him because they thought he was a foreigner, and and she had two children with him. Uh, I did, I knew her growing up. The last time I saw her, I was about 20 and I just, I was a journalist at the time. I decided I wanted to meet her and sort of find out some stuff about her. She's very not forthcoming, <laughs> family tradition of keeping secrets. And, uh, but at least I sort of went to see her. She seemed a bit bemused as to why her granddaughter had bothered to come to Whanganui to have a chat with her. Um, but I'm glad I did because I had that moment with her. She died shortly after that. Um, the other thing about Eileen I found, papers passed, her father was the mayor of, hmm, it escapes me now, Hastings I want to say, uh, he was quite a grand man. Uh, and uh, so I think that might be why Eileen didn't, her grandfather, sorry, her father, let's get on to that one, at the time that mum was born, he and his wife had three girls. The youngest was eight. Yes, I, yeah, three girls. He had just been done for embezzlement um, on one of the city councils down there uh, to the tune of about, I think it was about $30,000 in today's money. So he had to be, so he, the, again, couldn't find this, but he'd either been to prison or he was allowed out on probation. Family thinks he, he went to prison. So he was probably in prison at the time that Eileen got pregnant and brought this baby home, which may be why that family decided to sue uh, the father for some money, because they probably didn't have any money. Um, however, it remains that um, Eileen barely had anything to do with her family after they adopted mum out, and it's possibly because they took all the money and then, you know, got rid of the baby that they were getting the money for. Um, I do have to stop for questions. So please, someone tell me when it's about 10 to 1. What else can I tell you? Right. So in Wellington, um, really good source of everything. We've got the National Library, which has archives of newspaper on microfiche. So if you can't find what you want in Papers Plus, sometimes they will have stuff that hasn't been digitized into Papers Plus. So it's really worth going there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what Auckland Library has got. It may be that they have some as well. Uh, but as I was looking for New Plymouth, I kind of realized it would probably would be more Wellington based, any information I found. So you can you can actually sit there, scroll through. I got a migraine doing it. I did a whole day of like scrolling through, reading all the old newspapers, but it is a really good sort, really lovely staff, really nice place. You're surrounded by all these beautiful, New Zealand paintings. I just loved my time down there. Uh, so it's really worth going down and, and really helpful uh, research librarians. So you can say, I'm looking for this and it's between these dates and they will really help you. Um, again, it could be the case in Auckland too for, for more local papers. Uh, there's also um, the archives building in Wellington, just down the road from the very friendly National Library. Um, I made the mistake of going there sort of in one of the lockdowns. I think it was like a level two, but I was allowed to go in. Uh, so basically what they've got is these huge big books of court records, anything legal records. So as you know, I was looking for the court record. Uh, so um, I had a terrible time there because they, the guy went and got all these, you know, you, had, you have to book them online and then he brought them out and he wouldn't come near me and you know, we had to eat like all that stuff, which was fine, uh, but I had no idea what I was doing. So, you you know, basically I was looking at all the court records for Taranaki and you're sort of scrolling down um, and I asked him for help. And he said, I can't come near you. I can't help you. I'm going, well, could you like shout from two meters away? I'd be fine with that. No, not allowed to do that. 
So I didn't have a lot of luck. I'm sure it's lovely now. I'm sure everyone's great, uh, but basically had to give up, which is really disappointing because I think had I been not in a lockdown or a level two, uh, and had there been more staff, not the guy who didn't want to help anyone, uh, he basically said, oh, I'm just here to make sure you don't steal the furniture. I'm like, great. I'm really going to steal this really disgusting old chair you put me in. Um, but that is a really good reference and it's all there. Uh, if you're looking for your know, marriage record, anything that's been recorded, it's pretty much in, in those books. So I found those, well, I would have found those really useful had I not struck that guy. Um, military records. Now, these are fantastic, especially if your relative is from the First World War, because they are all there. So I could find my grandfather's military record from World War I, Arthur Nissen. I got, it, it's amazing, like everywhere he fought, uh, it's written down, like someone's written it. It's quite hard to um, read that old fashioned handwriting, but I've got terrible writing myself, so it wasn't that hard for me. Uh, what recommendations he got, medals, all that kind of stuff that he got, his injury, where he got injured, what the injury was, um, and any information passed, and it's all just on your computer, you can just print it off at home, which I thought was just so astonishingly amazing. Um, and sadly, there was, and I just loved, I've mentioned it in the book, there was a letter from my grandfather after he came home after the war, and he'd gone to work for his brother um, in the timber mill, so into timber, because they're from Denmark. Um, and I think he'd had an accident, he cut his left ring finger in the machinery. So he'd written a letter to them to say, uh, just letting you know, basically, uh, I will be staying at this address. If you need me to be called up for service, I am ready and available. Uh, and then later, uh, another letter saying, oh, uh, I just cut my finger. Um, I'm no longer fit for service or something. Uh, but how fascinating. There's my grandfather, who I never met, who went mad in an asylum from, from syphilis. Here's his handwriting right in front of me. Uh, so I took it over to my dad and I said, look, here's your dad's handwriting. Have you ever seen it before? He's like, no. And he just slowly read it. And I thought, oh, he's going to burst into tears. This is such a big moment. And he said, oh, could have used capital C for Christmas. <laughs> uh, my dad is a journalist too, so he's really fussy about grammar. Um, but he did, I had to stop going over and sharing stuff with him about his dad. Uh, I offered to let him read through all those um, health records because it was literally just too much. Uh, and in the end, I just stopped because I could see that this was not a thing he was enjoying. And that's another thing to remember when you're researching your family's history. Some people just don't want to know. Uh, because it can be shocking uh, or, you know, as in my grandfather's records, it can be really sad. Um, and so I think it's a big mistake to decide that you are the genealogy researcher of your family and everyone wants to know exactly what you've got. Uh, and I know there are families where this happens, where they get email after email after email, I've just discovered this, I've just discovered that. Um, and I know now people are actually doing books, which is probably a better idea because then you can decide whether you want to read it or not. Um, but, you know, in some family secrets are best left undiscovered. Uh, I have not heard from my auntie since that book came out. So my mother was adopted into the family in Fitzroy. And then a year later, her sister was adopted. But what happened was her sister came in with her birth mother because Olive decided that it'd be great to have an extra pair of hands. They already had four boys and now they had two girls and times were tough. Uh, that woman made my mother's life hell. Uh, she had a biscuit jar where she made beautiful cookies just for mum's sister. No one else in the house was allowed them. This set up a terrible disorder in my mother. She um, was overweight all her life. She binged ate. She just she had three freezers at one stage because she was scared she'd run out of food and be hungry. Uh, so I wrote, I didn't name my aunt. I didn't uh, name any of the, the, her mother, but I did talk about some of that stuff. But I left a hell of a lot out. Uh, and I knew that 
probably I would not hear from my aunt if I did that. I'm a little bit worried she might sue me because my her daughter is a lawyer. <laughs> um, but my publishers sent it to the lawyer. You know, it's my story. And I think that's the other thing to consider when researching family. And if you do decide to write it up and put it in a book to share with whoever or to get published, um, is it your story? Or is it everyone's story? Do you have the right to tell everyone's story? And I certainly battled with that before I pub before I sent my manuscript in. Uh, I consulted my kids who are very wise. Uh, and I said, you know, I, this is my story to tell. And I should have the right to tell it. But I know it's going to hurt some people. So they quite rightly, my kids said, look, get, get your brother to read it. So my, I have a brother, Mark. Uh, there's just the two of us. So I said, hey, you need to read this for me. And he read it and went, um, yep, that's, that's fine with me. He said, the stuff about our childhood, though, is a lot worse than you've said. <laughs> And he started telling me all these stories about what mum did to him. So I was like, quickly changed the intro to, uh, I have a brother and he has his own stories. <laughs> these are my stories. And um, I got that idea from James Taylor, who I love. And he did a, um, a memoir. Uh, and he has like four, three or four system siblings. And he did that in his. He said, look, we had the same childhood, but we had different memories and we have different experiences. And this is just mine. And I think that's a very good thing to do uh, because you're not trying to tell. I had another friend who did a memoir and mentioned her sister once in a funny story and her sister has never forgiven her. So I think either you get them to read it first or you go down the road. I also offered it to my dad to read and he declined but he had the offer. Uh, he was very supportive of me writing the book. He said, a lot of what you're discovering, um, I know your mum kept from you. And he didn't know any of this stuff either. Uh, and, and the stuff that, that he didn't know about his father, he actually was very grateful for. He said, I, I feel like I know my father much better now. Because remember the last time he saw him, he was eight. Um, and that gets me on to why why do this? Why bother spending? The thing about going down these websites and papers pass, and it's addictive as hell. Like you, while I was writing this book, I've written, I think I'm up to 12 books now. I've written a lot of books. And my husband said, whenever I'm writing, he can always just pop in and say, you want a cup of tea or uh, ask me something. And I'm always like, yeah, sure. When I was writing this book, I just totally ignored him. I would go for hours and he'd just walk away going, oh, shit, she's really, really down that rabbit hole. Uh, it is very addictive. It's because um, it's like a, a puzzle. You're just grabbing all these pieces and you're writing them down and then you put them together. So it is one of the best things I've ever done. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, when I'd finished, though, I did actually draw a line under it because I could just keep going. And I've already said to you, I need to go back and find out about my British grandmother's family. Um, because it would have overtaken my life. Um, I would have just not done any other work. So do be aware that it is really all consuming. Um, be understanding if your family gets a bit annoyed about that. Um, but the other thing it did for me, and I know Māori, uh, they have their whakapapa, you know, and they can go back to their canoe and that they are encouraged to do that, to find, you know, that journey through the relatives. And also they have such a beautiful oral tradition where they are told and they go to marae and you hear it all over again. Every time there's a tangi, you, you know, you just grow up, or well, most Maori, grow up knowing their tribes, their sub-tribes, the canoe, you know. And that's really good for a really good reason, because it's a bit like a tapestry. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but all the threads come together and in your soul, you feel, oh, I know, I know who I am. I know where I came from. I know what my people did. I know, you know, where they lived. Uh, so that was a huge thing for me. I found myself talking to Olive, the woman that adopted my mother because of her terrible, terrible time with the racing horse guy who killed himself. Um, to Arthur, my grandfather I never met, who is was in the mental hospital. I went and visited his grave. Never even knew it was there in the Hamilton Cemetery. I just, no one, dad never took us. Dad didn't even know he was buried there. Um, 
so I got to know those two really well. And I know Olive was very special in my mother's life. And dad's father was, you know, just absent from the whole family. So um, you do get this lovely feeling of everything coming together and things weaving together and knowing where you come from. So I could I could go back to Norway now to the village where my birth grandfather came from. I can go to Denmark and find out where my grandfather came from, from dad's son, my paternal grandfather. I can go to a village in England where my paternal grandmother was born. Didn't know any of this before. Um, Eileen, well, I know where she was born and I, I know quite a bit of her because fortunately mum's half brother who was born a lot later than mum, he's still alive. So he holds a lot of the history of that family and helped me a lot with the book actually. Uh, so I guess that's why you do it to uh, also to pass on to your children. So um, my children now know, actually I gave them all a copy of the book. I don't think anyone's read it. <laughs> Just between you and me. Uh, I think, to be honest, I'd warned them that the stuff about the granddad and the syphilis, and I think they're all just like, oh, too hard. Five, um, five minutes, Wendell. Thanks. So having said that, um, I think they'll read it one day. Anyway, happy to take questions. Thank you for the reminder, Shona. You're welcome. Um, we do have some, some uh, questions here. Um, uh, somebody was asking, um, Kim was asking, how did you store all the information you found? Did you did you store it digitally and print it or did you just store it print or did you just store it as hard copy? Look, if my office wasn't such a mess, I would scan down and show you that there are, ooh, what are there? There's about three boxes plus this gorgeous suitcase wow. <laughs> um, full of documents, birth certificates, you get a lot of stuff. You get the birth certificates, death, you get marriage certificates, you get so much stuff. Uh, so I have just put it in boxes um, where it's dry and um, I don't know what will happen to it. Uh, but I do also have digital copies on my laptop as well. But it was really important, I think, for me to have it all printed out and in, a, in one place. Awesome, thank you. Um, Eleanor was some... Um saying wasn't the secrecy so very sad her own family and her husband's were similar and some of the stuff they've found has been a mixture of hilarious bemusing and surprising and she's found many a dodgy family member oh well this is the thing and i think that's i write in my book i think my parents generation were quite upwardly mobile so they you know they came from working class rotorua working class new plymouth moved to auckland moved into the middle class and i think when you do that you don't you're not going to sit around over a glass of wine and a pottery goblet as my mother used to in her uh beautiful 70s caftan and tell them about the sins of your fathers are you you're not so um i think there was a very good reason for people to keep secrets um but yes uh when i finished the book my husband said to me i always knew you were de descended from rogues and vagabonds and i'm quite proud of that i'm mm. like yeah cool the the colourful figures in um in our family's history are often the ones that are documented, um and the yeah. ones that the ones that live goodly goodly lives yeah. as they used to call it are often the ones that are forgotten. <laughs> so it is quite funny. Um and also there's a whole thing too is at looking at your ancestors through today's lens. You know what was um what was good what was okay back in those days or looked at differently in those days you can't kind of subscribe today's um no um, biases to can you so yeah. it's okay now to bring the secrets out and, and analyze them i think i think we were much more understanding uh, mm. times yeah yeah um brent says did you start writing with a narrative arc in mind or did the material provide you with the narrative yes I'll let you in on a bit of my own secret. I wrote this book as a series of essays, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, I was interviewing Noel, Noel McCarthy at a book festival recently, and her great memoir called Grand, I'm looking around for it, but I'm all done with it. Uh, mm -hmm. She did the same thing, which was, um, and I think this is a good tip for anyone who's starting to write. The thing mm -hmm. that I know as a writer, uh, as a journalist, is just start, you know, get mm -hmm. it down. Don't start, you know, try to plan it or I know a lot of writers do post-it notes. 
I just wrote essays. So each one was about 3,000 words long because that seems to naturally be how, how long I write an essay for. And then I kind of just drew them all together and <laughs> sent it to my publisher, who was absolutely horrified. She was uh-huh. like, I'm used to receiving really, because when I write nonfiction, my other books were similar, but I did a better job. So basically then an editor put them all in the right order and, you know, so it ran better. So my, yeah, there was no great planning. I just would find a story, write it, put it mm-hmm. in the file, find a story, write it. And that's how I did it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a lot of a um, thing that um, us, us that research our family history struggle with. Um, when do you start writing? Um, you know, you do your research and you think, when I've finished, I'll start writing. But the thing is, no. you never finish, do you? It's no, and never the other finished. thing is, you're worried you'll forget. Mm. So I actually did forget a lot of stuff because mm. I didn't write it all down. And, and it wasn't until I was going back and oh, that's right. I spent that whole day. Where is mm. that stuff? So um, it's good to just churn it over really quickly get it in it doesn't have to be perfect writing it can just be stream of consciousness whatever's in your head just get it down yeah and later you can go back and craft it and go oh well it would have been better if that had been there and then you can turn it into a really beautiful piece of writing but at the beginning it's just drafting just draft after draft yeah um kirsten says how did you choose who to write about and your she comments your mother's story is fascinating and thank you for sharing it with us and the insights into into dimension dimension care as I can't get my words out as well very informative oh thank you you've obviously read the book I appreciate the feedback yeah. on you thank you um how did I choose who to write about they chose me and and I know that sounds all a bit ooky spooky but really I would find someone else write about them then that would lead me on to someone else and then that would lead to somewhere else and um, I really did it all. The only re- thing I started thinking was I want to find dad's mum's dad. That was the first, that was the only, and that led to all of these other things. As my research skills got better from, from doing that, I could then apply them to other people. And um, yeah, so I didn't make any choice at all. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Fiona says, not a question, but a comment. My family is on the Alzheimer's journey and yes, it is dreadful and it has its gifts. Um, Her father spoke in the early stages of the illness about many things in his past that he would never have talked about when he was well. That, same for me, same for me. Um, She never told me, you know, she went to her deathbed not telling me a lot, but as she was, uh, as dementia, I write this in my book, uh, so I'll briefly tell you, my mother had three personalities. Uh, There was good Alice, she changed her name from Elsie to Alice. So good Alice was amazing. She was funny, witty, well-read, just a great person. Bad Alice was just angry, angry, angry. And if bad Alice was there and you walked in the room, you got out as fast as you could because she was about to attack you about anything, what you were wearing, anything. And then there was Lady Alice and she was very posh and a bit like Hyacinth Bouquet, <laughs> um, but a terrible <laughs> snob at the same time and very a very know-all kind of person. So the, the as I write in the book, the good thing that dementia did for our relationship is that it killed off those two two people. And what I got was actually my mother, as she was meant to be her whole life, nice Alice. And so I and and I heard a lot more about her childhood. I learned a lot more about yeah, she just would open up about stuff that she'd never talked about before. So um, and a lot of the stuff I left out of the book because of my auntie. That was the stuff I got when she had to mention. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Wendy says, did you encounter any documents at Archives in New Zealand where you had to get permission from an agency to view it? Um, she's curious because she had to get permission to view her grandfather's child w- welfare file um, as he was born in 1905 and abandoned by his unmarried parents. Oh, sad, eh? What happened? Mm. Um I think you do when it comes to medical, I mean, I definitely had to get permission to get my grandfather's medical records. So I think anything along those lines, you do. And that's why, as I said, it was great that dad was still alive. If he hadn't been alive, I would have had to go to all my cousins and the chance of them all agreeing was just none. So um, yeah, that's the one thing I did have to get permission for. But military records, I'm quite surprised, just there for the taking. Yeah. Awesome, eh? Um, Mm -hmm. Uh, Brent says, did you encounter any 
brick walls, <laughs> family history terms. Um, at, how did you get around them? Or did you get around them? Uh, if there were any brick walls, I did get around them. And that was just through dogged research. Just the, the thing I probably should have mentioned, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So yeah. I would just try a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, one case of, of that was I was researching, trying to find my father's brother's birth date because I needed his, you know, when he was born. And I, it, it just wouldn't come up on birth desk. So, because I put his specific year and then I just put, oh, I'll just put five years either way, you know, because maybe they lied about, I don't know. And it turned out, I found out that my grandparents had a stillborn before him. So I had right. no idea that had happened. So you've just got to be a little bit creative. Um, also do call on family members. I was lucky enough, uh, especially with my mother's research that, you know, all these new cousins had done a lot of work anyway. So they were able to sort of steer me in the right direction. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, I'm just going to hand over to um, David, who's actually in the fare, um, so that he can, um, so that he can ask questions of, uh, ask you questions from the people that are actually in the room. So, um, so David, um, I'll, I'll let you take over um, now that you've come up with a technical solution to get around that issue. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to um, bring my computer around and if you've got a question, put it into my mouthpiece here. I'm going to a bit of this at the moment. Um, thank you for sharing all those really um, special moments and your discoveries. Um, I'm about to start applying for medical records, and I'm concerned that, um, I thought it would be that if people had died, then you'd be able to get them more easily. If you were, like I'm, looking, I'm gonna look for my grandfather. As I understand it, and I may be wrong here, if it's 100 years ago, fine. Anything up to 100 years, you have to get permission from from people but even that like my husband still can't find I mentioned earlier his aunties that were put into an insane asylum and that was like late 1800s he still they still are insisting on permission so I'm, I'm not clear on that but certainly in my experience and my husband's experience we've had to get permission from the family uh, and, and I think that's privacy but I, I have a feeling after 100 years it's fine can I just add with the 100 years, don't let it put you off, like make, do go down the track and do make the inquiries. Um, because the other thing is, I think different health boards are quite different too. And it just depends who you strike. And the woman I struck was just so damn helpful, but I've heard that others aren't. So it's, uh, don't let it prevent you starting. Uh, and as I say, you know, there may be other sources where you can find information that aren't necessarily health records. So you yeah, definitely do make a start. <laughs>